Okay, so what are we going to do today? We are going to look at a topic that I uh, like very much. It's an application of product structure yet again. But it's a bit different from the types of applications we've been looking at so far. All right, so um, the applications we've been looking at so far are include queue numbers. That's a vertex ordering problem. And then almost all the other applications we looked at uh, in some details, there are some types of colorings problem. Non-repetitive colorings, P-centered colorings, vertex L rankings, that was a coloring problem. Um, there was the, this uh, um, fractional tree depth fragility business, which is not exactly a coloring problem, but it's quite close. So today I want to show you um, an application which is a bit different from that. And again, the main difficulty will be understanding how to handle the operation of taking the strong product with a path. Right? This is always what we need to understand for the problem we study. How do we uh, handle our problem when we take the strong product with a path? So I want to show you some techniques to do that. Okay, so what's the problem that we are going to look at? It's called the problem of building universal graphs for in this case, planar graphs. Okay, so what is a universal graph? So take your favorite set of graphs, for instance, n vertex planar graphs. So we are going to fix the number of vertices. And what you want to do is that you want to build a single graph, G, that contains all the members of your set as a subgraph. Not as an induced subgraph, just as a normal subgraph. Okay? So if you care about n vertex planar graphs, for instance, you want a single graph that contains all your n vertex planar graphs as a subgraph. If you care about n vertex trees, you want to do the same for, for these n vertex trees. Again, it's a single graph, and it should contain all the graphs from your set as a subgraph. Let me stress that your universal graph does not have to belong to the class of graphs that you're interested in. So if you build a universal graph for planar graphs, your universal graph does not need to be planar. That would be quite restrictive if uh, we forced it to be uh, planar. Okay, so the universal graph does not need to be in the class. And then the next question is, well, what's a good universal graph? Right? Because obviously, since we care, we care about the subgraph relation, and I'm looking at graphs on n vertices, some fixed number n of vertices, I could always take the complete graph on n vertices. This is definitely universal for whatever set of graphs on n vertices you give me. But you know, like intuitively, this is not a very interesting or insightful universal graph. So, so we want to build some universal graph that is somehow good. And the way we are going to measure the quality of our universal graph is that we are going to count the number of edges. Right? So we want to build a universal graph that has as few edges as possible. Right, and so if you see the examples that I mentioned so far, I'm mentioning examples of uh, graphs that are sparse, that have at most linearly many edges in the number of n of vertices. And so the game here is to build the universal graph where the number of edges is as close as possible to a linear function. Right? So you would ideally want to have some near linear bound on the number of edges. There are cases where we can do it. There are cases where it's still an open problem whether we can do it. That's essentially the topic of this uh, lecture. And um, okay, so let me let me tell you right away which tool are we going to use today in this lecture. We are going to use separators. This will be the basic tool to build our universal graphs. And of course, as you might expect, on top of that, at some point, we are going to throw in product structure. Uh, but this will come in a second stage. So for the time being, let's uh, focus on how to build universal graphs with separators. This is very natural, and uh, it's also quite classic, it's quite old. Um, and this will be a good starting point to, uh, before we apply the product structure. All right, you all remember the definition of separators from yesterday, right? subset X of vertices so that when you remove it, you can arrange the connected components into two sets. They each have size at most two thirds. Okay, 
once you have the notion of a separator, you can, as a warm-up, uh, and this will be pretty important for this lecture, um, try to build some universal graphs for n-vertex trees. Right? We, we care about planar graphs, but let's start with trees, so that at least we understand what to do with trees. Because, you know, the, the idea is always, if you want to apply product structure first, you should understand how to deal with your problem on bounded tree with graphs. So it, it seems a good idea to start with trees. Okay, so now you have some, you, you care about n vertex trees, and the basic fact that we are going to use that we recalled yesterday is that in an n vertex tree there is always a single vertex which is a separator. Right? And now, if you use this observation, probably the first construction you would uh, come up with if you had to build a universal graph for n vertex trees on the spot right now, it, using separators, it, it probably will be this one. And the idea is what? Well, you know, let's rip off uh, a vertex which is a separator iteratively and recurse on each side. And on each side, you recursively put the construction for whatever ver number of vertices you have there uh, for the, uh, yes, inductively. More precisely, you create a vertex in your universal graph that you're building, where, which is where you're going to embed the, the vertex which is your separator in your tree, right? That vertex, you make it universal to everything else in your construction that you are going to define inductively, right? So this is where you are going to embed your first separator, the first vertex separating your tree. And now you know, well, when you remove that separator, this splits the tree into a bunch of connected components. You have left and right, and you know that you have at most two thirds n on each side. Okay? So you prepare for that, right? Of course, on the left, you have a bunch of connected components, so it's really a forest on at most two thirds n vertices, but this is contained in a tree on at most two thirds n vertices. So you prepare for trees on at most two thirds n vertices. In other words, you put down the construction for two thirds n vertices, right? So this will inductively contain uh, everything that is uh, on the left here. And you do the same on the right. But you know, you make one small observation is that if left and right have size at most two thirds n, the smaller of the two sides will have size at most n over two. Right? So there is always one side that contains at most half of the vertices, and let's say this is <coughs> this side. Right? So one of the two sides you can prepare for only n over two vertices. So you put down inductively the construction for trees on n over two vertices. Right, so that's a, that's a natural construction. Now, I'm not going to do the, the counting with you, but if you do it, you will see that uh, the number of edges is about n to the 1.3. Okay, so it's, it's already much better than quadratic in n. It's better than the complete graph on n vertices. It's not like a near linear bound. And intuitively, what's going wrong is that, you know, in one step of the construction, there is a, a blow up of the, of the number of vertices. You are preparing not for n vertices in total, but you are preparing for a bit more, because you have a two third n here, and not a, a one half n. And, and this accumulates over time, and this creates more vertices, and hence more edges. Um, so this is what is going wrong. But this is another, well, there is a question, yes. It's, I'm wondering what happens if you uh, insist that the universal graph should be on n vertices. Can we achieve some compression? Because here we're going to have a larger number of yes, vertices, yes. right? Okay, so I'm anticipating on the, on the next few slides, but we are going to see a construction using exactly n vertices. Ah, okay. okay. Um, for, for trees. For planar graphs, it will use it will use more than n vertices. I don't know how to do it only with n vertices. But yes, that's a good question. Okay, so back to separators. So this two thirds n is somehow unavoidable because you know even in trees you might be unlucky and the tree that you are looking at you know might be this um, this cubic tree. Complete cubic tree with all the 
it at the same level. And now if you think about it, well, your separator will obviously be the root, even the way that I drew that tree. And now when you remove that vertex, you have three components, each of size about another tree. So you're, you, you're forced to you know, group two of them together on one side and one on the other side. So, the, so you're forced to you know, put two of them on one side and another three on the other. So if you just use like single vertex separator, well, you know, there isn't, there isn't much else you can do with this approach. So ideally what we would like is to change our notion of separator and say, well, you know, I really want to have two parts, each of size at most and over two. Right? That's ideally what we would like, and then this, uh, this looks better. So let's do even more. You know, let's do that, but let's even ask that left and right have exactly the same size. Right? So this will be the notion of what I call a perfectly balanced separator. So it's a vertex subset so that when you remove it, you can arrange the connected components into two sets of equal size. Right? So you're splitting the graph in like two parts that are exactly the same size. This is the best notion of separators you could hope for. Right? Obviously, these two parts will have size at most another two, but they have size exactly n minus x over two if you have x, your perfectly balanced separator. And now it's no longer true that in a tree you can find a vertex or a constant number of vertices that form a perfectly balanced separator. But you know, if you're happy with paying some, some log factors, you can find uh, a perfectly balanced separator of size big O log n. This is really a consequence of the fact that uh, trees. Um, OK, let me not anticipate, anticipate why this is true. Let me show you why this is true, because this, uh, this is important. Um, how do we build these perfectly balanced separators? So I'm, I'm going to do it for trees, but then the same strategy will work in any graph class that has small separators. In particular, when you have bounded tree graphs, uh, we are going to use that. <laughs> OK, so for trees, take your vertex, which is a separator in the usual sense, and remove it and recurse left and right. Okay, so that's the first vertex you remove, and you recurse left and right. Then left, you remove again a separator for the left part, and you recurse, etc., etc. Okay, so, so this this is the first separator you take. These are the two separators you take at the next table, etc. So you have a recursion tree which is drawn in gray, which models like the successive separators you took in this uh, recursive course. So this recursion tree does, has nothing to do, uh, I mean, the edges there have nothing to do with the edges of the tree, right? Yeah, I mean, this is just modeling the, the separators you took at each stage. I'm not saying, you know, that this vertex that you took there and this vertex that you took there, I'm not saying that they are adjacent or not. This is just modeling the recursion tree, okay? So let's not, go, not get confused. Okay, so we have this recursion uh, uh, tree, this separator tree, if you want. And now, what are we going to do? Well, you know, we are going to make some observations. First, okay, maybe let me go back to the previous slide. Now, think of an edge of your graph. Well, my starting graph is a, is a tree, but think of an edge of your graph connecting u and v. I'm claiming that this edge must connect uh, u and v in the graph, but u and v they must be comparable with respect to the ancestor relation in that recursion tree. And why is that? Well, look at what's happening. When I remove the root here, I separate left from right. So I have no edges between left and right in my graph. Now I'm going to say graph for my initial tree because I want to avoid confusing with the, the recursion tree. Right? And this is true recursively. So it means that if you look at an edge UV of your graph, it connects two vertices which are, uh, which are comparable with respect to the ancestor relation in the separator tree. Is that clear? Yeah, okay. So what does it mean? It means that your starting graph is a subgraph of the closure of that uh, recursion tree, right? 
So if you think of the exercise session from yesterday, this means that this is this tree, this recursion tree here, gives provides a tree depth decomposition of your graph. Because the closure of that tree contains your starting graph, which happens to be a tree. Okay, now when we know we are going to play with that uh, tree depth decomposition, and we are going to use it to build our perfectly balanced separator. How do we do that? Well, we start from a leaf of that uh, separator tree. We take the path to the root in that recursion tree. And that, this will be some subset X of vertices. And now we observe that this subset separates all the vertices that are on the left from all the vertices that are on the right. Why? Because imagine that you have a path connecting a vertex on the left to a, a vertex on the right. On that path, there will be an edge where you go from left to right. But if you have an edge where you go from left to right, it means that these two vertices, which are the endpoints of that edge, they must be comparable with respect to the ancestor relation. But that's not possible to have a guy on the left and a guy on the right, which are comparable with respect to ancestor relation. OK? So, so this separates left from right. And now the game that we are going to play is we start you know, drawing of our recursion tree. We start with the leftmost leaf. And now we look at the left path, which is currently empty. And we look at the right path, which is almost everything. Everything except the, the stuff in our uh, path that we are looking at. And now we, you know, we move from leaf to leaves. And we always move to the next leaf. So what's, what's happening when we move from one leaf to the next? For instance, when I move from this leaf to the next. Well, when I move from this leaf to, the, to that leaf, well, my path in the range only changes a little bit. And what's happening is that I'm losing that vertex which was on the right. And this vertex which was in my path now is going to the, to the left. Right? So the right is decreasing a bit, the left is increasing a bit. OK, let's do one more step. When you go from here to here, well, you know, all this stuff now goes to the left, and all that stuff now disappears from the right. But the height of this tree is, a, is at most log in this 3 over 2 of n, right? Because each time you take the separator, and the, the bigger side has a size at most 2 thirds of the current size. OK, so this, uh, this set in orange has size big of log n. OK, so whenever you go from a leaf to the next one, right loses at most big of log n vertices, and left gains at most big of log n vertices. So you know, the changes are quite small at each step. So you, you, know, you, you will find a choice of a leaf so that left and right are about the same, up to you, you know, some log n vertices. Okay? Now you pick that choice, right? And this will be almost your perfectly balanced separator. Right? So you pick that choice, and now left and right are almost of the same size. They differ by about log n vertices at most. And then you make them of really equal size by removing up to log n vertices from the bigger side, and you put them in the, uh, the separator that you're building. And then your separator, which is still of size big O of log n, is a perfectly balanced separator. Is that convincing? Yeah? OK. OK, so that's how to be perfectly balanced separator for trees, but this will work whenever you have small separators. OK, so now let's use it. And uh, as suggested by Pierre, let's build a universal graph on exactly n vertices for trees. So here is our improved construction based on perfectly balanced separators. Uh, imagine that we are guaranteed that there is always a perfectly balanced separator of size at most c log n in our tree. Okay? And by the way, if you give me a perfectly balanced separator and it's of size less than c log n, you know, I can look at it and I can remove some vertices from left and right so that it has size exactly c log n. So I will pretend that you give me a perfectly balanced separator of size exactly c log n. Okay, so what do I do? Well, I prepare for that perfectly balanced separator by putting down a click on C log n vertices. That click, I make it universal to everything else that I'm going to build 
in my uh, recursive calls in, in the inductive stack. Okay? So I put down a click on CLOG and vertices and it will be adjacent to everything. And now, because it's a perfectly balanced separator, I know exactly that what's left will be split in two equal parts. So I know exactly how many for how many vertices I should prepare on the left and on the right. My, namely, it's n minus c log n over 2 on each side. And I put recursively the construction there. So this uses precisely n vertices in total. Hopefully, you're convinced that this is universal for the vertex trees. Right? Recursively put perfectly balanced separator there, recurs on left and right. Of course, left and right, they might not be trees, they will be forest, but this is contained in a tree, so it's fine. How many edges do we use? Let me close the door. So how many edges do we use? Well, let's look at what's... <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay. Mine should be good. Well, let's look at what's happening in one step of the construction. In one step of the construction, namely when I put down the first click on C log n vertices, how many vertices or how many edges do I create? Well, I create, I mean, okay, I create about log squared n edges for the click itself, but that won't matter. Uh, what, what really will dominate is the, the edges between the click and the rest. Why? Because I have about n vertices here. Well, to be precise, I have n minus c log n, but this is about n. So I have about n vertices here, c log n vertices there, so I'm putting down about n log n edges, big of n log n edges. That's in one step of the construction. Okay? What's happening in the second step, just you know, to see what's in what's the pattern? Well, in the second step here I have about n over two vertices. I'm, go uh, I'm going to create a clique of size c log n over 2, so that's about c log n. And then I'm going to put down a number of edges, which is about c log n times n over 2 here. And same here, the number of edges I'm going to put down at the next level will be c log n times n over 2. So in total, for the next level, this will be about c log n times n again. Right? I'm, you know doing rough estimations. Right, so in each level, I definitely put at most c log n times n edges. How many levels do I have? Well, I have at most log n levels. So in total, the number of edges is at most n log squared n in that uh, very simple and natural construction. Okay? So this would be like the basis of how do we deal with trees, how do we deal with bounded tree with graphs. Uh, and you see, it's a very simple construction, but it's important for us to understand really how it works. And interestingly, for trees, it's, it's almost the best possible. It's not the best possible. It turns out that you can be a bit more careful and there is a better construction, but more complicated, where you only use n log n edges instead of n log squared n. So you can shave off one log n factor. That's a theorem of Trung and Graham from the early 80s. But you know, up to a log n factor, this is essentially the best possible. Does that make sense so far? Okay. Now, why, okay, so that's kind of a remark, but why can't, cannot we hope for better than n log n for trees? Right, so I say that n log n edges is the best possible for n vertex trees, that you cannot do better. But if you look at it for the first time, you might think, okay, but why can't we do like big of n? That would be like great. But, you know, they are, they are just, uh, too many n vertex trees in a sense. And one quick way to see that you are forced to put down n log n edges in your universal graph is the following. So if you have a universal graph for n vertex trees, well, you need to accommodate the tree which is a star. Right? That star has a center which has degree n minus one. But you also need to accommodate the tree which or at least let's look at forest, this will be easier. You need to accommodate the forest, which consists of two stars on n over two vertices. Okay, I'm not caring about ceilings and floors. Let's pretend that n is a multiple of two. Okay, 
And this, you know, the, these two stars, they have two centers, each of degree roughly another two, another two minus one. But you also need to accommodate three stars, each of, you know, another three vertices. In which case, the centers have uh, degrees roughly another three, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? So it means that in your universal graph, you need to have one vertex of degree at least, and minus one, you need to have at least two vertices of degree at least n over 2 minus 1, you need to have three vertices of degree at least n over 3 minus 1, etc. So if you look at the degree sequence sorted in non-increasing order of your universal graph, it must dominate, so component-wise it must be at least this degree sequence, n minus 1, and n over 2 minus 1, n over 3 minus 1, etc. So it means that when you do the sum of the degrees of your universal graph, you sum this uh, these degrees, well, you will have at least n log n. Right, so the number of edges is, uh, must, must grow at least like n log n. Right? Okay, so that's uh, you know pretty simple lower bound for trees. Uh, it shows that n log n is really the best you can hope for. And amazingly, this is the best known lower bound for planar graphs. For n vertex planar graphs, I mean, I mean, planar graphs, you can do much more things in pl with planar graphs than with trees, right? But we don't know how to beat the lower bound, the n log n lower bound for planar graphs. So for all we know, there could be a universal graph or n vertex planar graph that has only n log n edges. We are really far from proving that. <laughs> but this is in uh, the realm of uh, possibility. This is the, the best lower bound we know. All right, so now, you know, let's try to step uh, back a bit and uh, let's see uh, what we really did with separators. There was nothing special about trees. The only thing that we used is that there were small separators. Small separators gave you small balance separators up to a log factor, and then that was the basis of the construction of our universal graph. And you can do that for any class of graphs that has small separators. So, you know, let's, let's formalize this, that a little bit. Say that you have some class of graphs. Um, say that, yeah, say that it's closed under subgraphs, uh, just for, for good measure at least. Yeah, so, in, so actually, if you were looking at trees, you would, look, you would be looking at forests. That's a, that's a detail. And now imagine that you're, you're promised, you're guaranteed that all the vertex graphs in your class, they have a small separator. Separator of size at most some function s of n. So it can depend on the number of vertices. For instance, for planar graphs, this would be about root n. Right? For trees, this is 1. Okay? For tree with k, this is k plus 1, as we've seen yesterday. Okay? Now, if you have small separators of size at most s of n for the n vertex graphs in your class, you have uh, small, perfectly balanced separators. You just pay a log n factor. And the reason is that you can run exactly the proof that we discussed uh, here. The only difference is that in the recursion tree, a node of the recursion tree will not correspond to a single vertex, but will correspond to a separator that you took at that step. Right? So this will be the first separator that you took. This will be the, these, uh, will be the next two separators that you take at the next level, etc. But except for that small difference, it's exactly the same proof. Right? And you incur a, a log n factor when you, you do that proof. All right. So you can go from separators to perfectly balanced separators by paying a log n factor, which we are really happy to pay in this context. And then you, know, you can build exactly the same construction that we did for trees using these perfectly balanced separators. And you do the, the counting of the number of edges as we did, and you see that the total number of edges, there is this n log squared n that appears again, and you pay also the size of your separator. Right? So if the separator, so if your initial separators have size one or constant, this is n log squared n edges. For instance, for bounded tree graphs, graphs of tree with eight, for instance. This is n log squared n edges in that case. Now, if you were looking at uh, planar graphs, this would be root n times n log squared n, if you do this uh, naive counting. 
But uh, this is a small remark, and it's really not important for us because we don't really care about polylog factors. But let me just mention that if you move on to the domain where you're looking at separators which are strongly subinar in size but polynomial in M, then these extra log factors they disappear because there is a, a geometric series phenomenon. So in particular, if you go from a separator of size S of N, in that case, if your separator is of size like N to the alpha, where alpha is between uh, strictly between 0 and 1, so for instance, if S of N is root N, for instance, uh, then you get perfectly balanced separator of about the same size. You just incur a constant factor instead of a log N factor. And the reason is because it's, it's uh, rapidly shrinking. I'm not doing the, the counting, but what's happening in the, the recursion tree here, well, take, take root N, uh, for instance, as an example. Well, the first separator is of size root N, okay? But then here on each side, you have at most 2,000 vertices. So the next separator will be of size at most root 2,000, right? Which is, you know, you have a shrinking factor. So you have root n times a shrinking factor, et cetera, et cetera. So it shrinks rap rapidly, and this uh, compensates the, the log n levels. OK. So, you in, um, so this is a small remark, but if you are in that realm where the separator is, is of polynomial size, then you don't have the extra log n factor. And also, when you bound the number of edges in the construction here, the second uh, log n factor, you don't have it because you have the same shrinking happening uh, at each stage. So that's a small detail, but it implies that in that setting, you, the number of edges is size of the separator times n. We go of that. So in particular, for planar graphs, you have root and size separators. So you have we go of root n times n. So this is n to the 3 half edges using this construction. Does that make sense so far? OK. so. What we discussed is essentially uh, the content of uh, um, this theorem of uh, these authors from 1982, where they built a universal graph having n to the 3 half edges for, for n vertex planar graphs. It's this recursive construction. But there is nothing special about planarity there. The only thing they, they use is the fact that you have root and separators. So for any class that has small separators, you can do that construction. So that's quite, you know, that's quite large because there are lots of interesting classes with uh, strongly sublinear size separators. Now what we are going to do today is that we are going to see how to improve this n to the 3 half to a near linear bound using product structure. Okay? So we are going, we are going to decrease that bound. But the price to pay is, of course, you lose the generality. This will only work when you have a product structure. So this will work for planar graphs and a bunch of other classes that have product structure that, for instance, we mentioned yesterday, like graphs on, on a fixed surface, for instance. Um, but uh, it, it definitely doesn't work for like all the classes that are captured by this construction based on separators. Okay. So before moving to product structure, you know, let me just mention uh, some graphs where some classes of graphs where you can do this uh, construction based on separators because they have strongly subinar size separators. So planar graphs we already mentioned, but one way to generalize planarity, which is different from the ways we discussed so far, is uh, by adding dimensions. So one way to think of planar graphs, you can think of them as the kissing coin representation. Right, so you have this disk in the plane, their interiors are pairwise disjoint, and you put an edge between the disk if they touch. That's a one way to represent planar graphs. And this can be generalized in Rd for d bigger than 2. And in that case, you have touching balls in Rd. So balls that are, whose interiors are pairwise disjoint, and the corresponding vertices are adjacent if the balls touch. And it's a pretty nice result that these graphs of touching balls in Rd, they have small separators, strongly sublinear in N. So more precisely, if you fix D, they have separators of size big of N to the 1 minus 1 over D. Right? So if D is 2, you, you find the, the root N size 
again. But this is just a special case of this phenomenon that you have for touching booths in RD. Okay, so that's an example where, you know, using these small separators, you get a universal graph with uh, these many edges. So you pay the size of the separator times n. So it's n to the 2 minus 1 over d here. And we have no idea how to improve that for d at least 3 because we don't have a product structure for those graphs. Okay, so that's like an example where the best known construction is still this. Now, of course, there are some other examples where, the, where, where we have separators, but uh, we, we are going to have a product structure as well. So if you go back to surfaces, where well, they have root and size separators if you fix the, your surface. Um, so if you just use separators, you have a construction where the number of edges is about n to the 3 half. The constant factor depends on the genus. Uh, that will be improved using product structure, but the next case, and that's why I mentioned it, won't be improved using product structure. So the next case is, while well, instead of looking at graphs on the surface, you exclude a fixed graph as a minor. So if you exclude a fixed graph as a minor, you have again root and size separators. That's a theorem of Alan Singer and Thomas, um, where you have a dependency on, on the size of the graph that you forbid, of course. And so this leads to universal graphs where having n to the 3 half edges yet again, if you fix uh, a graph that you exclude as a minor, and we don't have a product structure if you, if you forbid a fixed graph as a minor, only if you forbid an apex minor. So this is yet the best known bound in that case. It's conjecture that you can have a near linear bound, but the, the, the best known bound so far is uh, still n to the 3 half. Okay, so this gives you a bit uh, an idea of the, the landscape so far. Okay, third example, well, keep in the graphs, they have root and size separators if you fix k. And so you have again n to the 3 half there, there. There is a product structure, so this will be improved. All right, so what do we get as a bound? Uh, I will be a little bit more precise about what I mean by near linear. But uh, think of a near linear as n to the 1 plus e to the of 1. So near the of 1 is something that goes to 0 as n goes to infinity. Okay, so we get universal graphs with uh, a near linear number of edges in this, uh, uh, in this sense. And of course, we, so we do that for planar graphs, but we do that for any class of graphs that has a product structure of the form bounded through it times a path. Right, so the main technical theorem is this one. And, okay. Let's, let, let's pass it uh, in detail. So it says the following, that say that you care about a set of n vertex graphs, so the number of vertices is always fixed, n vertices. Say that you care about n vertex graphs that are subgraphs of some h times p for some h of trivial at most t and some path p. So more precisely, say that you have a class of graphs on n vertices so that for every graph in that class you can find it as a subgraph of h times p for some choice of h that depends on your graph and some path p. I'm emphasizing the dependence of h on the graph that you're looking at. Why am I even emphasizing this? Think of planar graphs again. So when we have a planar graph g, we know that it's contained in h times p for some h of 3 that must 8. But this h depends on g. I mean, if you think of the proof that we've seen on Monday, the h that we get at the end, using the tripod decomposition, for instance, is it definitely depends on the starting graph, right? Right, so the, the, if, if we take planar graphs as an example, for every planar graph g on n vertices, there will be a choice of h and p, so that g is contained in h times p. So I'm emphasizing that the, the choice of h depends on, on g. So the, the theorem here is of this form. Imagine that you have a class, a set of n vertex graphs, so that for every graph g in your set, for instance n vertex planar graphs, 
you can find a graph H that depends on your graph and a path P so that your graph is contained in the product. If you can do that, then you have a universal graph with a near linear uh, number of edges for your set of graphs. So in particular for planet graphs, T is 8 in that case, so we, we have what we want. Okay, so does the statement make sense? Yes? Okay. Now, the next thing that we are going to do is we are going to, to clean up a bit the problem. Okay, so we want to use product structure and the key thing will be how do we take uh, the strong product with the path? Right? We have some H times P, H has bounded through it, and we know how to deal with bounded through it graphs. That's what we've seen so far. Right? We know how to build universal graphs for bounded through it graphs. That was the point of the first part of the lecture. So now we need to understand how to handle taking a strong product with a path. And this, this, uh, this will require some work. At least we, uh, we, have, we don't know how to do it in a simple way. Um, so this will require some, uh, some setup. But the first thing we are going to do uh, in before we start building our universal graph is to clean up the problem uh, a bit to have a nicer looking problem. The first thing we do when, okay, for every set, graph G in our set that we care about, for instance, think of n vertex planar graphs, there is a choice of H and P so that G is contained in the product of H and P, right? That's the setup. Now, what do we know about H and P? Well, H definitely has at most n vertices, right? Because G has n vertices. Maybe it has less. Well, if it has less vertices, let's just pretend it has n vertices. You can add back some vertices in H. This won't hurt anything, right? Worst case, you put them as isolated vertices if you want. But if H is smaller than n in terms of the number of vertices, just make it so that it has n vertices. You know, just to uniformize a bit the picture. Right, so you might assume, you may assume that n, uh, uh, that, sorry, that H has n vertices exactly. What about P? Well, P was modeling the, the you know, the, the, the BFS layers, right? In worst case, you have N layers. Well, let's pretend that you always have N layers. Let's, let's take P to have N vertices. Again, you might be good, you know, with a path on 10 vertices. You might not need a P with N vertices for a particular graph G in your class. But, you know, there will be some graph in your class where you, you, you might need to have the whole n vertices. And the idea is, you know, to try to uniformize the picture. So let's pretend that P has n vertices. Okay, so now for every graph G in our class, for instance, n vertex planar graphs, we are get, get, getting a corresponding pair H and P, but now we assume that H and P, they both have n vertices. Right? This, this really simplifies a bit uh, all that. Okay, so that was cleanup number one. Now, cleanup number two, we are going to deal with the fact that H depends on, on our graph G. Okay? This, is a, this is an easy cleanup, but this is con conceptually important for what we are going to do. Right? So right now, we have some graph G. For instance, let's take a n vertex plane graph. And this graph G, gives a pair HP such that um, G is contained in the product and now we assume that H has N vertices and P has N vertices. Right, they have N vertices by your first schema. Right, but for every graph G we have a corresponding pair H and P. What would be really nice is if you know if we only had to look at a single pair HP, not at all possible pairs HP that can come up from a graph in the class. So that's the next step, going from all possible pairs HP to a single pair. So the path, this is quite, this is already done in a way, right? Because we already fixed the number of vertices of your path. There is a single path on n vertices. So that path is already fixed. 
right? So now the path is not very at all. It's a, it's a path on n vertices. So that part we fixed. What is still a variable is h, this bounded three-read graph. Say this uh, three-read eight graph. This will definitely depend on the graph g that you started with. And so, so a small difficulty when you start working on this problem is that you don't really know which graph of three-read eight to shoot for in your construction. So you know, it would be nice if you could, instead of having to prepare for all three-bit edge graphs, you only have to prepare for a single graph. And that's exactly the notion of universal graphs, right? So the next cleaning up, which is like very easy but conceptually important, is instead of caring about all possible three-bit edge graphs, let's replace this edge part by a universal graph for three-bit edge. And we know how to build them. We know what, what they look like. They have a very simple structure. <coughs> so now we are going to just replace this H part by a universal graph for to read it. Right? So in, those, in other words, what we are going to look at is strong product of Hn times P, where this is a universal graph of three read well, for n vertex graphs of three read at most t. Okay? So that's the next cleaning up. Does that make sense in terms of uh, steps? Okay, so this way, we, we don't have this uh, target which is constantly moving, and we, we, are, we, we know that we can only care about one, uh, one strong product, this universal graph for 3 bit 8, I'm still taking this, uh, taking this example for planar graph, times a path on n vertices. All right. OK, I should have mentioned something before that slide. OK, so we know what the universal graph for 3 read 8 looks like. We just discussed it in length. It has exactly n vertices. And we know how to build it. Now, the next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to switch to a universal graph which is almost the same, but not exactly the one that we defined. It, it's a little bit uh, coarser, but it has about the same number of edges. And the reason I'm going to do this switch is because this universal graph for 3 8 or 3 t yeah, can be expressed in a very compact way. So it, what I'm going to show you on the next slide is essentially the construction we discussed, it, but it's not exactly the same, but it's the same idea. And, but it will be easier to handle. OK, so that's the content of this slide. OK, so we have 3 t, for instance, 3 with 8. You know that. This implies small separators, separators of size at most t plus 1. So you have perfectly balanced separators of size at most t log n, roughly. And so by the previous construction, we have a universal graphs where the number of edges is above t and log squared n. That we, we are all happy with that. Now, I'm going to take the following graph as a universal graph. And I'm going to take that one because it has a very compact description. So let's see what this is. What is C sub log n first? Well, C sub d, this is a complete binary tree of height d plus all the edges implied by transitivity. So in other words, this is a transitive closure of a complete binary tree of height d. Okay? Think of C sub d as like, you know, essentially modeling your recursion tree or your separator tree. Uh, okay, so you have C sub D, which is uh, the closure of a complete binary tree of height D. And what are we going to do? We are going to take the strong product with a clique of size omega, and omega is just a shorthand for the, the size of our perfectly balanced separator. So this is about T times log n. Right, so think of omega as you know, whatever guarantee we are given on the size of the perfectly balanced separators. About t log n, in the case of planar graphs, this is about log n. Okay? So we are taking this tree here, 
transitive closure, and then we take strong product with a click on, on about log and vertices. Taking strong product with a click is the same as blowing up every vertex by by a click of size omega. Okay, so we have we have this tree. We blow up every vertex by a click of size omega, which is about log n or t log n if you have if you care about three t. And now, if you look at the picture, it should be clear that this is universal for for t. Right? This is essentially the same construction as before. It's not exactly the same because you will have a bit more vertices. It, it ha doesn't have exactly in vertices, but you know, I mean, like the, the spirit of the construction is the same. And in terms of bounding on graph edges, this will be good enough. But why do we do that? It's because well, this universal graph you can describe it in a very compact way, right? This nice tree where you take the transitive closure and then you take strong product with a click. Okay, now I'm going to use that to do another cleanup of the problem. Okay, so what do we want? Well, now we care about this strong product, right? C sub log n times our click of size omega times a path on n vertices. Why do we care about this? Because this is exactly our universal graph for 3 with 8 times our path on n vertices, right? The first product here, this is our universal graph for 3 with 8 or 3 with t, and this is our path on n vertices. And what we care about is realizing the n vertex subgraphs of that product. Why? If I have an n vertex planar graph, I know that it's contained into the product of h times p for some choice of h. I know that in turn h is contained into our universal graph. So h times p will be contained in universal graph times p for, for the tree t. Okay? And this universal graph is c log n times k omega. Okay, so our g will be contained as a subgraph in that product. So it's an n vertex subgraph of that product. So if we realize all the n vertex subgraphs of that product, we are done. Right? So in other words, our job now is to find a universal graph for the following set of graphs, all the n vertex subgraphs of this product. Okay, so we, you know, we, so far we haven't done much, right? We just we, we cleaned up a bit the problem, we rephrased the question. But what is nice is that we somehow fix the picture uh, in, in, a, in a very uh, useful way that we only need to, to think about this uh, graph there and all its n vertex subgraphs. And we have to prepare for all its n vertex subgraphs in our universal graph. Okay. And now the heart of the, the construction is the, the following theorem. And this is where we are going to use the shape of our universal graph for upon the tree width. So instead of looking at that graph, which is the one we really care about, I'm going to drop the strong product with a click. And that's in the, that this is yet another cleaning up step. So instead of looking at that, I'm going to look at the product of C sub log n times the path on n vertices. So what I really care is looking at n vertex subgraphs of this graph. But what we are going to do is building a universal graph for the n vertex subgraphs of this graph. So I'm going to pretend that you know the blow up by your click of size omega is not there. So why is this enough? Well, I claim that you know if you can solve this and you have a universal graph in this setting, then you can just take that universal graph, blow up every vertex by a click of size omega, and then you have one for this graph. I mean, intuitively, this makes sense, right? This graph is, is really C log n times Pn, where you blow up every vertex by a click of size omega. So if you don't blow up every vertex by a click of size omega, you might as well build a universal graph here, and then blow up the vertices of that universal graph by a click of size omega. And intuitively, this makes sense. Or you can check the, the proof, but this is exactly what it's saying that you that this works, right? And I mean, this is again a, a simple, uh, an easy simplification, but it means that now 
we can focus on looking at n vertex subgraphs of C sub log n times Pn. And this is why I wanted to take this special universal graph for, for trivial t. It's because it has a very compact description and I can then drop <laughs> the, the times a click <laughs> to, it, to simplify further. Okay, so this is the end of the simplifications in somehow, in, in a way. So now we really have to work, we have to use product structure, we have to, I mean, at, at some point we need to build starting our or universal graph. But this is where we really start. Now, but the, the picture is really nice because we, we are looking at n vertex subgraphs of a graph which has a very, very nice structure, complete binary tree of height log n plus transitive closure times the path. I mean, if you should think about where we started, we started with n vertex <coughs> planar graphs, and now we are looking at n vertex subgraphs of this. I mean, even though each step is really simple, I mean, this is clearly a much more restricted problem in a sense. And now this is what we are going to study. Okay? Um, all right. How do we approach that? So we need to build our universal graph. And I'm going to tell you what the vertices of your universal graph are, but I'm not going to tell you right away what the edges are. So how do we define the vertices? Well, the vertices, there will be triples, x, y, z. This x, y, z, they are bit strings. x will encode some position on the x-axis. So this will correspond to the horizontal dimension, to, uh, to the bounded tree graph, if you want. Or in, in this case, it happens to be the universal graph of bounded tree graph. Y really encodes some position on the y-axis, so in this path Pn. But it won't exactly be a position in Pn, but OK. It, it's intuitively, it's some vertical position. And then Z is some extra information which is not really important, but we need it, but it, it, uh, it's some extra information to help us. Okay, so what, what are the conditions on these uh, bit strings? Well, the main condition is that X and Y in size, they sum up to about log N. And all the logs are in base 2, and that's important. We really want logs in base 2, <laughs> right? So the, uh, X and Y, they sum up to log in base 2 of N, plus something which is much smaller. I mean, the exact shape of this function is not really important. What's important is that this is a little of log N. But if you, if you have any little of log N here, you would have a, a near linear bound for the number of edges in our universal graph. So they sum up to about log N in size, these bit strings. And then Z, as I said, you know, Z is something separate. This stores some extra information, and that bit string is really, really small of size log log n. Uh, so it, it won't matter that much. As I mentioned, x and y then code positions in mean, respectively the x-axis and the y-axis, but they are actually positions in and some associated data structure. And these data structures are binary such trees. Okay, and that's the main idea in this proof is actually to build uh, BSTs, binary such trees, uh, one on the, the path PN, indexing you know, the, the rows, indexing the, the levels. And then you will also have one binary such tree in each row. So in each row of your product, you have N rows, there will be a corresponding binary such tree. So at this point, it's not really clear what are the points of these binary search trees. I will try to convey uh, some intuition about what they are doing. But right now, just know that X and Y then code positions in, the, in these binary search trees. Okay. And the last uh, thing which is very important is that all the binary search trees we are going to play with, they are essentially perfectly balanced then we don't really know how many elements they contain, but if they contain k elements, they will uh, have height about log in base 2 of k. That will be really important. Okay? 
Now let me try to give some uh, more interesting. Oh, maybe uh, yeah, maybe I should first recall what a binary search tree is. No, I'm pretty sure you are all familiar with this. So it's a binary tree, but uh, you have some uh, some uh, extra key or um, number on the on the nodes of your tree, and the condition is that. Well, if you have some number i on the node, then everything in the left subtree should be strictly smaller, everything in the right subtree should be strictly bigger. Now let's look a bit at what, what is the, the purpose of the vertical binary search tree. Now the thing that you have to have in mind is that this vertical binary search tree, it will depend on the graph g that you are trying to embed. So you have some n vertex planar graph G, you know, which lives in this product that we are studying right now. This n vertex planar graph, it's using some of the rows. The goal of this binary search tree, which I call the vertical binary search tree, so on the rows, on the on the the, the vertices of the path PN that index the row, the rows. The goal is to somehow encode which rows are used by, by your specific graph G that you are trying to embed in this universal graph that we are going to construct. Right? So I'm already thinking about how to embed my graph, even though I didn't really define the universal graph yet. Okay? So let's start with an, you know, a simple case. Imagine that you the end vertex graph that you want to embed it uses exactly one vertex in each row. It's spread out very nicely. Okay? So in that case, each row has weight one. So in, in red, you have the row weight. And I'm going to number the rows from one up to n, uh, say top uh, to bottom. Okay? Now I build a binary search tree on the row. I, if you remember, I want it to be, it to be balanced or even perfectly balanced. Uh, so there is an obvious, essentially only one way to do it, right? So you take the middle, you put it in the root, you recurse on left and right, and this gives you uh, a binary search tree on, on the rows, right? Okay? Nice BST of size log n. Now what happens if, like in a typical case, you know, the, the graph that you are trying to embed in your universal graph, is actually focused only on a few rows. Like most of the rows, they have weight zero, and it's only using some of the rows in your product. That's more typical. And maybe it's using these rows with weight, I don't know, six and six here, and weight one, one, one here. Now, the idea is that you actually want that the rows that have heavy weight, you want them to be close to the root in your vertical binary search tree. So, as an illustration, in this case, maybe the, the vertical BST that you're going to construct will look like this, maybe. So what's happening here, well, what's happening is that the two rows with big weight, row six and 10, which both have weight six, they are really close to the root here. And the other rows which have weight one, you are happy to you know, put them uh, further down in your BST. Okay, now let me bo be more precise about what we want to achieve, what we want to guarantee in our vertical BST. So what we want to guarantee is that if rho i has weight, say, w i, we want to achieve that its position in the tree is not too deep if it has big weight. So if it has big weight, it should be close to the root. More precisely, we want to show, to get that the depth in the vertical BST is um, at most log in base two of n minus log of, of its weight, roughly. There will be some error term, like th this is what we would ideally want, but this is uh, essentially the goal, right? Right, so if, if you have big weights in the vertical BST, the, the, the index of your row, so row i, 
should be to should have small depth, right? So it should be close to the root. Obviously, the standard construction of weight biased BSTs that you might know will, uh, if you given weights that sum up to to n, we will do that. Uh, so there is a standard way of building these uh, weight biased uh, binary search trees. But we want to achieve that. And now let me give you a little bit of uh, intuition. If that still makes sense to everyone, hopefully. Yes. Okay. So let me give me let me give you a bit of uh, intuition about what we are going to do, and this hopefully will give you a glimpse of what the universal graph will, will look like. So when I want to embed some specific graph G that has n vertices in my universal graph that I still have to, to define, you know. The first thing I'm going to do is, you know, build this uh, weight biased vertical binary search tree. And as you remember, the definition of the vertices of my universal graph, I have an X component, a Y component, and a Z component. The Y component, this is what we are looking at right now, is the position in the vertical binary search tree. How do we encode the position? In a, in a BST, when in the most natural way. If you have a BST, you start from the root, and you know, you write left, right, left, until you reach your node. Right? So every node has a signature, which is a binary string, and that signature, the length of that signature, is the depth of your vertex in the tree. Right? So in other words, what we want here is that the rows that have big weight, they have short signatures. Okay. So in other words, for when we want to encode, when we, when we are going to map the vertices of our graph G that are in row I to the vertices of our universal graph, if row I has big weight, some weight W I, we, we will have a short signature to describe in which row these vertices are. This will be the, the signature in that vertical binary search tree, and we are going to use that at most that many bits, log n minus log wi. So now we are going to be left with, you know, about log wi uh, bits to describe where your vertex is in the i row. Right? So that's the, that's the next step. Again, the first thing we do is we describe in which row our vertex is. Okay? This, this takes about log n minus log wi bits. And then, once you, once you specify which row you are in, you are going to specify which vertex it is in this row, and you have log wi bits to do that. And there are wi vertices in that row that are used. You don't know which one. Right, so that will be the next step is, you know, to, to try to see how to encode in a compact way the vertices that you use in the i row. Okay? So at this point you might be frustrated and think, okay, but, but this doesn't tell me how I put the edges in my universal graph, right? But I still haven't told you that. I'm, right now I'm talking about how to embed vertices how to map the vertices of the graph G that I want to embed as a subgraph, how do I map them to vertices of my universal graph? I'm only talking about that. But once we understood that, then you're going to see which edges we should put. Okay? So this will hopefully make sense. Okay, so the next job is encode position of the vertex that we are mapping to, a that we are trying to map to a vertex of the universal graph encode its position in, in row i. And this, this is the part that is more tricky. Okay. Let's look at row i, and let's start with a nice example. Imagine that you know, the graph that we want to embed is completely focused on row i. It's using fully row i. What is row i looking at? What, what, what row i, do, how does row i look at? Uh, look like, sorry. <laughs> I will eventually uh, manage to 
uh, say it right. Okay, so when you look at rho i, this is a copy of your universal graph of boundary true. Well, it's the universal graph minus, you know, the blow up with a kick, but that's a small detail. So we know that it looks like that, right? It's the transitive closure of a complete binary tree of height log n. So this is the full row i, this is what it looks like. But uh, we are going to use some subset of those vertices. Now, row i, I'm going to use a numbering of my, my graph here, which is quite natural. I'm going to number the vertices of row i according to this uh, complete binary tree. And I'm going to think of this binary tree as a BST. Right, so the root will be 8, everything on the left will be smaller, everything on the right will be bigger, and here it comes. That's the like, natural numbering of the vertices of the graph in row i. Now, if you're, like, if you're lucky and the graph you care about happens to use all the vertices in row i, so it's like, just consisting of one row, then the corresponding binary search tree that you are going to build for row i for the graph that you are going to embed I mean, it's pretty natural that you should just use that binary search tree. Right? So let's just use, do that. So in that case, if you use everything in the row, your BST, well, it's the same. Right? <laughs> you just take, the, take this as your BST, and you're done. And um, right, every vertex here can be encoded. Its position can be encoded by uh, describing the path to that vertex in that uh, BST. But of course, I mean, in typical case, you are only using some wi vertices in row i. You have no idea what wi is. It could be between 1 and n. And you have to prepare for all kinds of subsets of vertices that you could use in row i. And that's the difficulty. So how do we do that? Well, the idea is that if you only use a subset of the vertices, you are going to build a binary search tree associated to that row for the graph that you are trying to embed. And you are going to make sure that that BST is perfectly balanced, or almost perfectly balanced. OK? So for each row, we build a binary search tree. That binary search tree contains whatever vertices of that row are used by the graph that we are trying to embed and we want the binary search tree to be perfectly balanced. Okay? So if I use only these three vertices, well, this might, is this the, the BST that I'm going to look at? Well, it's really on, only these three, right? Okay. Now, what next? Um, so you could stop there and say, good, I have a strategy to build my universal graph. Okay, let me tell you that this doesn't work, but this is like, that was the starting point of the approach. The strategy is first build this vertical binary search tree, which is perfectly balanced on the rows, according to the weights on the rows. And then when you look at the graph that you're trying to embed, for each row, look, uh, con construct a perfectly balanced binary search tree containing only the vertices that you use from that row. Okay, and now, now we know how to map the vertices of the graph that we, are, that we are trying to embed to a pair X and Y of bit strings. So far, I haven't used Z. But OK, we can do that. But now the problem is that if you start, now if you need to put edges between uh, the vertices that you define in your universal graph, intuitively, what you have to prepare for is all the possible transitions from a row to the next one. And now, I mean, this is quite complicated, but imagine that you look at, I don't know, like vertex 6 in row i. Maybe vertex 6 in row i is at the root in that BST. OK? Where is, and maybe vertex 6 is used also in row i plus 1. Where is vertex 6? in the BST of row i plus 1. If you build these BSTs separately, independently, vertex 6 could be anywhere in row i plus 1. But, but in the product, you have an edge between vertex 6 in row i and vertex 6 in row i plus 1. So you have to, prepare, to be prepared for all these connections, right? 
and, the, and there you already put n edges between two consecutive rows, right? So <laughs> just that, this is already way, way too many edges. Okay, so, so, so this is not a good idea. You should not build the, the BSTs separately for, for each row. Because then, once you decided on the mapping of the graph that you are trying to embed to the vertices of your universal graph, well, you must put the edges that you need, and this is too many. Okay, so that's the starting point of the idea, but it doesn't work. So what works is instead of building the BSTs row by, uh, independently for each row and having a nicely perfectly balanced BST is to, to do that on row one. Row one, you start with a perfectly balanced BST of whatever you use from row one. And then when you go from row one to row two, you make some insertions, deletions, and rebalancing. What do you insert? You, you insert the vertices of row two that were not in row one. What do you delete? You delete the vertices of row one that are not in row two. So you probably know very well how to do insertions and deletions in a BST, right? And you probably know that if you started with a balanced BST, after you do these insertions and deletions, typically you're not balanced anymore. So you have to do some rebalancing. But now we want to do a rebalancing operation which has the property that you know, every vertex can move to only a few possible positions. We don't want to do rebalancing that, you know, changes completely the shape of our tree. And why is that? Well, what we want, ideally, is that if vertex 6 in row i is at some position, and vertex 6 is still there in row i plus 1, we want to be able to anticipate which are the positions where vertex 6 will be. And we want to say there are only a few of them, like a tiny number of possible positions. So we want to have a rebalancing operation which is nice in this way, that, that only moves around each vertex a bit. Globally, it can do a lot of operations, but for each vertex, it should move it only to a few uh, potential positions. OK, so that was the idea. The problem is that, well, the, you know, there are lots of data structures uh, 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 that provide balanced binary search trees. But we, in the literature, we didn't find any that was doing the job, that, were, that, that was doing what we wanted. So, so what we did is to, to define a, a homemade uh, data structure, and especially in a homemade rebalancing operation that does exactly that. That's actually the main technical part of the paper, it's this uh, data structure, and the rebalancing operation is a bit technical. I'm definitely not going into that here, but just know that the idea is that it is defined in such a way that every vertex can move to only a handful of positions. And this is doable. And once you have that, then you can, in your universal graph, you can prepare all the edges between two consecutive rows. Because you know that every vertex will move to only a handful of positions. And you also have to take care of edges, right? So if you have an edge UV in row I, well, you know, U can only move to a handful of positions, V can only move to a handful of positions, so you can prepare for the edges between U, V as well. And, and shouldn't it be two to this power of potential positions, that it's not two to this thing position? For the number of vertices? No. Sorry, I didn't get your I question. Oh, no, no, I'm asking about the last, uh, last row. Yes. And it says that there is very few potential positions. Yes. And is it true? Right? Shouldn't it be two, two to this value of potential positions? No. No, it's it's really that. It's tiny. It's it's really tiny. Right? So if you don't know anything, you know, a vertex could move if you don't know anything about the next BST, you enroll I and you go to row I plus one, like the next the next position of your vertex six could be any n, any of the n uh, potential positions, and we really want. I mean that you can describe this position by that many bits. That was your end, no? Yes, you're right. You're right. You're completely right. Oh, that's a very good spot. Yes. Okay. Indeed, you're you're right. OK, so that's, uh, that's uh, a mistake. The new position should be uh, 
there should be a way to describe the new position using these many bits. So it's not about bounding the number of potential positions. Thanks a lot for, for spotting that. Okay, so indeed, in terms of number of potential positions, it's two to the to this number. Thanks. Yes. Okay, so uh, let me go back to the setup. What, what we are doing is that every vertex can move only to a small number of positions, and this move can be described with a very small number of bits, in particular with something which is little of log n bits. Okay? So that, that's the, really the, the idea of this construction. So that's what we, do, we did in this, uh, in this original paper, and then end of last year, a new paper appeared with, by these two authors, and they revisited that step of the construction. They, they, and they, they show that, in fact, actually, there is a way to simulate everything that we did there using uh, B trees, if you do it in the right way. So there is a way, actually, to just use B trees if you, if you approach it in, in the right way. And this even improves a little bit the, the error terms. Mm -hmm. Instead of using root of log n log log n bits here, you use root of log n bits. Right, so just know that this can be simulated using a, a simple data structure, but it, yes. Okay, so that's really the idea of this construction. I, I didn't give you many details on how, why is this data structure existing, why, how do we do the rebalancing, but at least hopefully you see what is the approach here. And uh, yeah, so the, the key ID, I guess the key general ID to handle the product structure is to de define these binary search trees and exploit them. All right, um, okay, so it implies that we have a near linear bound on the number of edges of our universal graph or planar graphs, or whenever you have a product structure, right? So for graphs on surfaces, uh, for k planar graphs, you have um, such things. Uh, but as I mentioned, this only works when you have a product structure and we still don't know how to handle, for instance, graphs that exclude a fixed graph as a minor. Because there we don't have a product structure and the best known bound is still the one that comes from separators, it's still n to the 3 half. So with the uh, five minutes left, let me tell you a little bit about a variant of this problem because actually we looked at the two versions and I, I wanted to focus on only one in this talk and for the exercise session we are going to focus on this variant so that you, know, this, you discover this variant uh, in the exercise session. But let me here just give you uh, the definition and, and uh, the context. So the variant is instead of looking at universality, uh, let's look at induced universality. So a graph is induced universal for a set of graphs if it contains all the members of your set as an induced subgraph. Okay. So what is the game here? Well, here when you when you want to build an induced universal graph, uh, it's it's not trivial just to define an induced universal graph because you cannot just take the complete graph on n vertices, <laughs> right? Uh, and for, for different reasons, what we are trying to minimize here is no longer the number of edges, but the number of vertices. This is a non-trivial problem now, right? For subgraphs, this was trivial, minimizing the number of vertices, just take the complete graph, but it made sense to minimize the number of edges. In this setup, we really want to minimize the number of vertices, right? So we want to build a, a graph that contains all the members of your set as an induced subgraph um, and that has as few vertices as possible. As we are going to see in the exercise session, uh, this can be rephrased in terms of adjacency labeling schemes. Um, that's another uh, viewpoint for the same problem. So what was known for planar graphs? Well, there there was a number of improvements over the year. Right? For, for the subgraph version, there was the n to the 3 half bound from 1982, and there was no improvement since then. But here, for this version, it was improved over the years. There was first an n to the 6 bound on the number of vertices, then it was improved to n to the 4, then quadratic. And then, 
Bonami Gawal and Mihal Pilipchuk used the product structure to get it down to and to the four thirds. Right, so they, they they quickly noticed that you know you can do something with product structure for that problem, and then they got it down to m to the four thirds. Um, so we don't know anything better than n. We don't even have an n log n log. Okay, so uh, I think we did. The construction is different, but the techniques are very similar. Is that we got uh, we got it down to n to the one plus the log of one vertices. So we got a near inner bound on the number of vertices. And the like the, the engine of the proof is this data structure uh, where we keep rebalancing when we go from row i to row i plus one. The engine is the same, and the fact that you can go only to a few positions. It, it relies on this. But the way we define the vertices, and especially the way we put the edges, it's a bit different. But like the engine is really the same. It's really the main tool behind. Right, so this works whenever you have a product structure. And you know, once you have a result for subgraph universal and induced uh, subgraph, uh, in induced universal, so universal in induced universal, you could ask, well, can you combine the two together? And it turns out that the construction we have here, it has a near linear number of vertices, but it has quadratically many edges. <laughs> so the, the, the construction is a bit different. It, it's very efficient in terms of minimizing the number of vertices, but it has lots of edges. There are big complete by that graphs in there. Uh, and it turns out that there is a way to have an even more complicated construction where you have both properties at the same time. So you can build an induced universal graph or n vertex planar graph with a near linear number of vertices and near linear number of edges. So you can actually solve both problems at the same time. But the construction is even more complicated and the, 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 the meaning of near linear is something much bigger than that. But it's still near linear. <laughs> Till n to the one plus the little of one. Okay, so I mentioned improvements that were based on using product structure, and as I emphasized a couple of times already, for classes of graphs where we don't have product structure, we don't know how to do better than the previous results. In particular, for subgraph universality, if you forbid a fixed minor. As I said, we don't know how to beat the n to the three half bound. And that's a very tempting problem. I mean, it should really be a, a near linear bound there, but we, we don't know how to prove it. And also, you know, for planar graphs, the best over bound we have is n log n, and we are still far away from n log n. Uh, and with the techniques we use, there is no way we are going, going to get close to, to n log n. So you, you might want to, to improve that as well. What about induced universal graphs? So there, if you forbid any graph of a, any fixed graph as a minor, there is a quadratic bound on the number of vertices. And this is still the best known bound. We don't know how to do to, to go below. And if you know a little bit about the, the graph, uh, the graph minor structure theorem of Robertson and Seymour, you might think, okay, but like can't I can't I use that and somehow reduce to some easier piece? And that I can understand, maybe remove the APCs and eventually get down to, to uh, an apex minor free graph and where I have product structure. So that's a very natural approach. But the, the problem is that we don't know how to handle kicksums. It, it, it's really annoying. We, we, we don't know, we, the, the, the stumbling block is we don't know what to do with kicksums. Okay, uh, again for planar graphs, we have a near linear upper bound on the number of vertices. But here, the lower bound is not even uh, n log n, it's n, big omega of n. And for trees, this is the right answer. For trees, this was an open problem for quite a while. What, what's the best induced universal graphs you can do for trees? And then a few years ago, uh, uh, some researchers proved that you can do big O of n. So that's, that, so that's tied for trees. And that might be the answer for pentagraphs, for all we know. All right, thank you for your attention and see you this afternoon. Unless there are questions. Yes, then. Yeah, there are still questions. So yes. You mentioned that for 3D, 
trees, you can do like in the EU setting in here. Does it generalize to like, let's say two trees, three trees? Um, okay. I hope I'm not going to say something wrong. I think it's open for bounded tree width. So yeah, I should check, but I think it's even open for two. Yeah, I actually meant bounded tree width, not two trees. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, I think it's still open for tree width two. Wait, I, I should check, but I, I think so. 